We're good. Um, so thanks to the uh, organizers for inviting me to talk on this topic. Um, I'm interested in ultrasound in, in hemodialysis and outside of hemodialysis, and although I'll mostly be talking about hemodialysis, a lot of these principles do apply to P sorry, PD and non-dialysis patients. Of course, you may be familiar with the use of ultrasound in critical care and otherwise. So for those of you that don't know me, as Mary says, I'm Claire. Um, the questions can be asked, as you're all familiar with, through the app. Um, and I'm also going to be using a poll. So if you don't have the app or if you already have it, open it up um, and we'll take a look. So I have no relevant disclosures. So um, I'm going to be talking about the current approaches to dry weight assessment, in particular for hemo. Um, and to look about the evidence for point of care ultrasound use uh, in volume assess status assessment, and also it's the same for bioimpedance. Talk a little bit about the practical applications of both, um, and I thought it would be worthwhile talking about some of the other technologies that can be used for dry weight assessment as well. So to get a sense of what the use is in the room and across the province, there's the first question from the poll is to look at what is the current use of point of care ultrasound, which just means ultrasound at the point of care, for dry weight assessment in your dialysis unit wherever you are. Is it not available at all? Is it available but never used? Occasional use, regular use, or it's integrated already into your workflow? So if you all can answer the first poll, I'll give you a few seconds. Let me know if you're having technical issues. Like everyone's looking at their phones, so that's good. We'll wait another few seconds. So I'll try to hope that this works. Okay, so um, I think they'll, it'll still come in as you guys answer, but it looks interestingly and not surprisingly that um, it's not available in many of your dialysis units, and I'm not specifying PD or hemo in this case. Um, available but never used, second response. Again, not surprising. Occasional use, regular use, and we don't have anybody saying it's integrated into the workflow in dialysis. So for those of you that answered D, if anyone wants to shout out where, they, where they're from, which uh, maybe just health authority, for those of you that say regular use. Vancouver Coastal, okay, all right. So I'll close that. And then the second question is, because I'm gonna be talking about bioimpedance as well, what is your current use of bioimpedance for dry weight assessment in your dialysis unit? Same questions, so if you can answer. And if you don't know what bioimpedance is, just say not available. <laughs> or answer however you like. All right, let's check it out. Okay, so again, the most common response is not available. Um, and then we have sort of a mixture of responses there um, with some people saying it's integrated into their workflow, which is great. Um, and so we'll hopefully learn a little bit more about these today so you can try to see if it's worth using in your own dialysis units. So first I think I would be remiss not to talk about the you know, why do we care about this? Why is volume overload important in dialysis? And we know it's common. So studies have shown that even at the end of dialysis, at the best time in patient's journey of their week, about 30% of them are still volume overloaded and meaning they're chronically volume overloaded. And we know this is associated with high morbidity and mortality. Um, and hypertension is something we see commonly cardiac dysfunction, and sudden cardiac death being a major cause of death for our patients. And similarly, high weight gains, not surprisingly associated with these same outcomes. And so 5% of body weight as an intradialytic weight gain would be, you know, about three kilos or so for your, or three and a half kilos for your 70 kilogram person. But if we just said, okay, we know volume overload's bad, let's make everyone dry, 
then we have to think about the risks of fluid removal itself. So excessive UF, uh, we're learning more and more, is associated with intradilytic hypotension we know, myocardial stunning, and other end organ ischemia. And we're seeing that more and more with Chris McIntyre and some other uh, researchers who see um, with high UF rates that the heart muscle is actually not working well, that the brain is getting less blood flow, that the liver is getting less blood flow, um, and that's really important for our patients. Also, we know that residual renal function is very important for our patients, and loss of residual renal function can be more with higher UF. High mortality, and then we hopefully all care about uh, the symptoms for patients, and certainly they tell us most of the time about these things, but um, cramping and dizziness and their overall quality of life could be impaired if we're taking off a lot of fluid. Um, and I think this... Um, graph really is helpful, showing that Jenny Fleith and others have shown that high UF rates are associated with higher mortality. And so this graph really shows that relationship well. Um, oops, I don't know if I'm going to be able to figure out this laser. So um, we see that this effect uh, persists across all subgroups, um, and in particular, I'll just use the mouse, uh, you see an upkick around 10 mil per kilogram per hour, and that may be a number that you're all familiar with. But at that time, it's about 2.8 liters in a dialysis run for a 70 kilogram person. And then really high uh, rates go up around 13 mils per kilogram per hour. Um, and that's both all cause and cardiac mortality. So what is a dry weight anyway? So it's often defined as the lowest tolerated post dialysis weight at which there are minimal symptoms of either hypo or hypervolemia, and it's often, some people will say it's the weight below, you know, where people hate you or where they complain, but sometimes we think of goal weight as the term that's more commonly used as, it feels more realistic, I think. Dry weight presumes that we're doing a great job of getting everyone dry. Goal weight makes us feel like we're doing the best that we can, so I think that's the term I hear a lot. Um, and it often involves, as you all know, trial and error. But because of how important volume status is, and I think I've shown that to you, um, several groups have advocated for it as a quality indicator in and of itself. So that UF rate of more than 13 mil uh, per kilogram per hour in the US is considered a quality measure. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about that because the response to that has been capping off how much fluid you can remove in a given session, which may have unintended consequences, but I think it's interesting for us to prioritize this for our patients in moving past the KT on V. But really, there's no gold standard in dry weight assessment, as I'm sure you're all familiar. So that brings us to kind of what we're all familiar with. If many of us said it's not available in our unit, so what are we doing now? So blood pressure is obviously very important, the usual physical exam at the bedside, so looking for swelling, crackles, elevated JVP, asking patients about their symptoms or them complaining of symptoms. But we know there's limitations to this approach and there's inaccuracy of the physical exam. These findings may be late findings and that's been shown certainly with peripheral edema as a late finding of volume overload. And this inconsistent relationship between high blood pressure or blood pressure in general and volume overload. And I think you all know that patients who have high blood pressure, they're not all volume overloaded and not all volume overloaded patients have high blood pressure. And although tr certain trials like the DRIP trial have shown that when we reduce goal weight, blood pressure gets better, that's not the case for everyone and there's limitations. So that brings me to the first sort of technology to talk about, which is point of care ultrasound. And so you can see just a picture, and I'll get more into it. This is a picture of lung ultrasound, which may or may not be familiar to all, um, showing somebody who's quite volume overloaded. So point of care ultrasound, as I said, is just ultrasound at the bedside, mainly done by obviously non-radiologists, and it's really well integrated now into medical education to the, to the point where if we don't adopt it, we're gonna be behind you know, the, the residents and the med students that are uh, coming up, and it's being integrated into Royal College and all their sort of credentialing as, as going forward. And the good news is it's easy to learn, and you can use different types of machines, handheld or full-size machines, and patients can have this done when they're either lying down or sitting up in a chair, which is useful for dialysis. And it's quick to do, which is obviously useful. We all don't have that much time. 
So in nephrology, it really is an evolving uh, tool that's in our toolbox for assessment of our patients. Um, but it, as you can see, even in this room, it varies a lot based on how, whether you have equipment, whether you have training, and whether you have experience. Um, but there are some other areas that we may, and I specifically didn't ask the question that way, I think all of us are familiar with ultrasound for procedures, ultrasound for vascular access, and then some who really pick up this skill may do even advanced echo or ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder, but I won't be talking about that. So we'll start with lung ultrasound, which I think is probably the most useful, at least from my point of view, in hemodialysis patients. And so this is really an interesting story because um, previously radiologists said there's no point in doing ultrasound of the lungs because the lungs are filled with air and air reflect, reflects or refracts uh, ultrasound waves. And so you can't see anything. You can't see anything structural in the lung. But then in the 1980s, a respirologist named Lichtenstein used um, these artifacts that were caused by refraction and actually found that those artifacts could be associated with lung pathology. Um, but because it's artifacts, I think it, it is a little bit difficult to wrap your head around at first because it's not anatomical. What you're looking at are artifacts related to pathology. And so the two main uses at the point of care are looking for pneumothorax, which we're not going to look at, but could be useful for central line placement and then looking at the lung parenchyma itself for these patterns of artifacts, namely focusing on A lines and B lines, which I'll explain. But I'm not gonna exhaustively talk about the technical aspects of this because it's much better learned in a practical course. Um, so as I said, the technique is kind of beyond our scope today, but um, there are different types of probes that you can use. There's the curvilinear or abdominal probe, or there's the phased array probe, which is typically used for cardiac imaging. And there's different ways to do this systematically. Um, some have examined on four areas on both sides and others have done a simplified approach and the patient can really be in any position. So without getting into the details of the techniques, I thought I'd show you a picture of what it may look like and this is the best case scenario for our patients where we see what are called A-lines. And what A-lines are, are they're basically just using this reverberation artifact. So the transducer from the ultrasound uh, on the skin, it bounces back from the pleural line because it's all filled with air and that's a big interface, a big difference. And so we see this white line here, which is the pleural line, and then it reflects back and back and back into equidistant curvilinear lines. So this is an A-line here and this is an A-line here. And so they're white lines. Um, and if you see them throughout the lung, that means that you have a normal aerated lung. So that's good. That's what we want to see in our patients. And you only really need to see one of these A-lines to know that there's normal aeration there. But you have a patient, say, coming into dialysis, they're short of breath. Um, they could still have something else going on, like COPD or a pulmonary embolus. But in terms of looking for fluid as a contributing factor for their shortness of breath, if you're seeing these A-lines, you're knowing it's uh, with good certainty it's not fluid. And I'll talk about the evidence in a minute. So B-lines are bad, B for bad. Um, they're basically the ultrasound equivalent of curly B-lines, which you may be familiar with from X-rays. And so normally on ultrasound, you can't see the intralobular septi because they're very small. But if you get fluid, you get fibrosis um, or consolidation there, then the fluid basically propagates the wave down from the pleural line, which is this white line at the top, all the way to the bottom of the screen. It has to go all the way to the bottom of the screen. And you get these ray-like or comet-like patterns that are hyperechoic, again, whitish, vertical, and extend to the bottom. And three or more is considered pathologic. And in case, unless you have a patient who you know has pulmonary fibrosis, if you're seeing these B-lines throughout the lungs, then in our dialysis patients, it's going to be fluid. So what's interesting about this is when we think about seeing fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema, we have to think, uh, of course, it's a measure of volume overload, and I'll show you the evidence for that. But if we're seeing fluid on the lungs but nowhere else, that may be because it's also a marker of the LV function and the permeability of the lungs, which has been found to be important in these patients. So this is a kind of simplified protocol that was used, which I basically tell people it's like auscultating the front of the chest. 
um, where you're looking in four areas and you can count up how many of those beelines or lung comets or lung rays that you find to look at the severity. But you get a sense when you practice of, of how significant it is and you can compare it over time for a given patient. So the evidence behind this is that it's actually more sensitive than chest x-ray, again, without the radiation um, or physical exam in de uh, detecting uh, pulmonary edema, consolidations, or pleural effusions, and often can be seen in asymptomatic patients. So when they've looked at this at a critical care level, it shows that that A-line pattern, which is those horizontal lines, correlates with normal or low pulmonary pressures um, versus the multiple B lines, those vertical lines, correlates very well with pulmonary edema. So high, very high sensitivity and specificity, much higher than chest x-ray or physical exam. So what about in dialysis? That's more in critical care. So in dialysis, um, B lines are associated with high BNP, cardiac events, and mortality. So prognostically, it's important. And there's actually a dose-response relationship between the number of B lines that a patient has and the mortality risk. So it can help stratify patients. Again, in the hemodialysis and PD populations, like the general population, it's more sensitive. There's a high inter-observer reliability, so it's easy to do and looking between uh, different people, they'll get the similar results. And it performs similar to bioimpedance in terms of identifying patients who are volume overloaded and predicting mortality. But so we know that lung ultrasound and seeing those B lines can tell us if patients are volume overloaded or not. But does that information help us change outcomes for patients? And right now we don't know that. So there is an ongoing trial called the LUST trial, it's a good name. Um, that's basically looking at using lung ultrasound in a more systematic fashion and seeing whether in high-risk patients they can actually reduce morbidity and mortality. So we don't know the results of that. It'll probably come out soon, um, but it's important for us to move past just the clinical assessment into outcomes because there's not much we can do to improve outcomes for our patients as we know. So what about IVC ultrasound? Um, so we, uh, this may be familiar to many of you in critical care areas, so that's a subcostal window of echo, and you use a phased array or curvilinear probe, and then you're looking at the IVC, which you can see here, whether how big it is, and it's measured two to three centimeters from the right atrial junction, and whether it collapses, and that's basically all you need to know. And in critical care, this is used to look for volume responsiveness, to estimate CVP, like you would with a PA catheter, and to rule out tamponade physiology and right heart failure. Um, but, uh, there's, there's a many buts, um, it's really just the extremes of size that are helpful. So we know that we can estimate CVP, but we know that in the general population, CVP is not always uh, the best correlate with volume responsiveness. So when we look at CVP, if we have a small uh, IVC and we measure this by using the machine and freezing it and using a measurement, that if it's very small and collapses a lot, then it correlates with low CVP. If it's very big and doesn't move an inch, it correlates with higher CVP. But there are lots of um, caveats because it is very dependent on who's doing it. Um, and we also know a lot less about how accurate this is in patients who are not mechanically ventilated, which is hopefully not a lot of our patients. Um, and so if, for example, if you're holding the ultrasound probe just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, you could actually underestimate uh, the diameter by having it off axis. Um, and you can collapse it yourself. If you're putting a lot of pressure on the abdomen, you can collapse it and you can fool yourself. You can also fool yourself with the aorta, and it can be difficult. If we have obese patients, it can be difficult to do. Um, but in dialysis, it, it is feasible. There is a high inter-rater reliability, and it can be done in dialysis chairs. So you don't have to have a patient lying down. That appears to correlate pretty well. Um, and it correlates as well with bioimpedance. But then again, when we get to the hard outcomes, um, there was some mixed results, um, and in particular, in the DRIP trial sub-study, they found that the IVC diameter kind of behaved in not always predictive ways. When goal weights were titrated down, it usually changed, but it wouldn't predict who would do better with their blood pressure, which is a limitation. 
Some of the other ultrasound techniques that some people use um, are the ultrasound of the jugular venous pressure. So looking at the internal jugular vein, similar to a physical exam. It does, again, correlate with CVP, but it seems to be not as good as other measures. So it suggested it could be done if you can't look at the IVC. And this is basically just putting gel on the neck uh, and measuring at the point of uh, collapse. And then advanced echo for those who really want to get trained. So um, again, because we're not focusing on the technical, I thought practical tips might be more useful. And so I think the most useful thing to think about if you're gonna use this technology is that these findings are dynamic. So if you do uh, ultrasound at the beginning of dialysis, on a non-dialysis day, at the end of dialysis, you're gonna see different things. And so if you have somebody who's volume overloaded and you see these B lines, these vertical lines, you take off four liters of fluid, which again, with risks, um, and you do it again, you're gonna see that some of these B lines disappear. And that might be useful, but when it comes to IVC, sometimes you don't know what to do. Because if you do IVC ultrasound towards the end of the run and you see a collapsible IVC, which we would usually think about in somebody who's dry, we don't know are they dry or do they just not refill well? And we all know about patients who have poor refill. And so it's probably most helpful to be consistent about the timing and to do these methods at the beginning of dialysis, if possible. In terms of how to integrate it, um, I think we all struggle with the logistics and the structure and the curtains, the patient privacy aspects. So we're gonna be looking at people's chests, we're gonna be looking at their abdomens, and we don't want the, their neighbors to see, right? So some units are different than others in terms of how well we can really establish patient privacy to make this actually successfully part of our workflow. Um, of course, you need a machine to do it, um, so you need to have it available, preferably in close uh, contact. Uh, um, <clears throat> I think it's really important to document uh, these findings. I, I see this a lot, um, not just in, in nephrology, but across critical care and otherwise where uh, ultrasound or other techniques are used, never written down, um, so we have no idea you know, what they really found. And I think this is important for patient care, but also potentially from a medical legal perspective, especially if it's actually making an impact on our, on our management. And you can take um, videos and snapshots that you could compare for a particular patient. So I think in terms of who would benefit from this technology, certainly shortness of patients with shortness of breath. So I've had patients, um, and this is uh, also backed up by the studies, who, you know, they just tell you, I, I'm finding a bit of shortness of breath on exertion, or I can't do as much as I used to, and they have no swelling, and their blood pressure may be fine, and then you do lung ultrasound, and you see that they have a lot of B lines, and then you reduce their goal weight, and they feel better. Um, so sometimes, you know, we know our patients can hide fluid, so dyspneic patients could be helpful. Patients with high or low blood pressure, difficult dry weight assessment, and that may be due to body habitus or other factors. And then um, some have proposed this as a tool to use for new dialysis starts. But again, could be used in hemo, could be used in PD, could be used in non-dialysis patients. So um, bioimpedance we'll talk about as well. So again, not used, it doesn't sound like used much uh, in this room. So bioimpedance um, is a technique for assessing hydration and body composition using electrical signals. So it's non-invasive, again, uh, painless, portable, it doesn't require a lot of training, and basically uses uh, electrodes that are placed typically on the forearm, on the non-fistula side, and on the ankle on the same side and you have the patient lying down, and it, usually in a stick man position. Um, and then basically it takes a reading. The computer software then analyzes the inputs along with some things that you have to input, like the height and the weight, um, and puts it into two outputs. So there's two useful outputs. One is the fluid status, and I'll talk more about the overhydration and total body water and extracellular water. And the second is body composition, which is very useful um, to know, especially for failing patients, how much lean tissue mass or adipose tissue mass they have. Um, and so there's lots of machines available, and I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, but just anecdotally, the most common one that's available is the Fresenius BCM or body composition monitor machine. 
and it uses multiple frequencies. So basically what it is, is it sends an impulse with low frequency and high frequency. The high frequency can go throughout the body and measures total body water. The low frequency, it can't get into the cells, so it's only measuring the extracellular water. And then it's compared to norms and some algorithms and fancy calculations I don't understand to determine um, the excess amount of hydration if it's there. So plus or minus one liter is considered normal and overhydration is more than one liter. Um, and it's compared to a reference range, so I'll talk about some of the limitations. Um, but abnormal for the overhydration over extracellular water is considered 15% or more. So this is a sort of snapshot of an example that you may be familiar with. Um, so OH means overhydration, and 2.8 liters overhydration is what was found in this patient. And then the, the ratio, which again I said was over 15% is abnormal, was 23.5. And there is an ability to look at a patient over time to see, you know, they were overhydrated and now they're, you know, less and their blood pressure in, in keep has gone down. So you can track a patient over time. So in dialysis, uh, again, as a prognosticator, high uh, ratio uh, of more than 15% is associated with mortality. Um, but st and studies kind of vary, is this a better predictor versus lung ultrasound, but it's kind of a wash. And same thing for PD. But I think it's interesting that there's actually randomized control trials in this area. So in, dialysis, in hemodialysis, there was an RCT done of about 150 patients to target dry weight. So basically, in the intervention group, they used twice monthly measurements to target dry weight. Uh, and then they also looked at echoes and ambulatory blood pressures. And for those in the intervention group where they were using bioimpedance to target goal weight, they actually had regression of LV mass, improvement in their left atrium volume index and blood pressure, as well as arterial stiffness. Um, not output, no difference in uh, hospitalizations or mortality, but they did have a number of surrogate outcomes that improved. And similarly, in PD populations, uh, there was a trial, similar-sized randomized control trial, which showed when using bioimpedance, the nurses that were using bioimpedance to help with the goal weight assessment for their PD patients actually had better improvement in the hydration status and blood pressure, but again, not hard outcomes. So there are some ongoing trials um, looking at whether or not this can improve uh, protection of residual renal function in PD. Um, and also hospitalizations and mortality. So again, caveats. Um, so there's only really small trials, although it's impressive there are some RCTs. Um, I think the biggest caveat that we all worry about is what is this normal reference range? Like we know our patients are different. Um, and so when we're using even fancy algorithms and trying to correct for things, we may end up with some error. So we have elderly patients who have very little muscle mass and they just may not fit in the norms. I think you've probably, those of you who have used this, have seen occasional bizarre readings, and typically they're at patients with the extremes of body size, so, you know, very cachectic or very obese. And there are some contraindications, which you're probably familiar with if you've used it, pacemakers, defibrillators, pregnancy, um, and then some relative contraindications, so patients with uh, artificial joints or pins, and then amputations, there are some ways around this where you can uh, do some special calculations to deal with the loss of a limb or loss of two limbs um, and putting the sensors on both hands instead of a hand and a foot. Um, but I think we do worry about the accuracy of that and certainly the studies have shown it's not as accurate so it needs to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, but the most common question I hear is what about PD fluid? Um, does that impact the results? And it seems like when they've compared patients who are full versus patients who are empty on PD, the results are, are relatively the same, at least in this study. So when looking at the two techniques, um, there is a little bit of a difference in at present who typically performs these techniques. So ultrasound is usually done by physicians, whereas bioimpedance may be done by dietitians or nurses. Uh, again, when you perform it may be slightly different. For PD patients, it could be any time for either of them. But for ultrasound, I would suggest that it's preferably t towards the beginning of the dialysis run, unless you're really thinking about the possible you know, contributing factors to changes that might occur. Um, they're both quick. 
Um, they both have some operator dependence, um, and there are some contraindications to bioimpedance, not really for ultrasound. Um, you may get some extra information from ultrasound with respect to cardiac function if you want to, um, and bioimpedance gives you more information about uh, body composition. And they both have evidence, certainly, that you can assess in an accurate and reliable way, for the most part, fluid status. But do we know if these tools actually improve patient outcomes? No, but there's ongoing study. So I thought we'd talk about some other tools that you probably are familiar with. So one that's commonly looked at is blood volume monitoring or relative plasma volume monitoring, which uses optical uh, transmission to measure an intradilytic change in hematocrit. So this is in real time, you can see it on the machine, and you can see a slope which is a function of both the ultrafiltration rate and the ability of the patient to refill. And that may be reflective of their volume status or it may reflect that they can't refill. Um, in a trial, the CLIMB trial, which looked at using uh, blood volume monitoring and algorithms to target dry weight, there was actually worse outcomes in the group that used blood volume monitoring. But there are a lot of flaws with that trial. There was sort of a suggestion of what to do and it wasn't um, you know, without its issues. Others have found that these curves are helpful, again, for the assessment, maybe not as in a systematic way, but a flat, and I think you've seen this, a flat uh, blood volume curve is helpful to predict volume overload and, and a good response to dry weight reduction and a response to blood pressure improvement with dry weight reduction. But again, limitations. And then last year, there was a paper um, published in CJSON by a group from Alberta which looked at the Fresenius uh, ultrafiltration control biofeedback, um, and this was a negative study. So basically, they didn't see an improvement in interdialytic hypotension ultrafiltration rates or bioimpedance measures using the uh, biofeedback. So, um, you know, there's some limitations there, but it could again be something you could look at to help you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then biomarkers, there's always something about biomarkers, right? So BNP and pro-BNP are proposed as markers of volume overload in dialysis, both PD and HD. But we know these are markers, again, of cardiovascular events and mortality. They're also markers of LV dysfunction and LV mass, which makes it very confounded in our patients. We know have a lot of that. Um, interestingly, high BNP levels also correlate with low BMIs and malnutrition, which I found interesting. And they don't seem to move up and down in the way that we would like, so we don't see somebody who's volume overloaded who gets uh, goal weight reduction necessarily that their BNP goes down. So we don't know what to do with it. So right now there's really no clear role um, for dry weight assessment with the current biomarkers. So many have proposed sort of a, as usual, a multifaceted approach, and this comes from a paper that was published in seminars of dialysis a few years ago, where I think as intuitive to us, we should use more than one thing, and we should use what's available to us. And so no one's going to abandon history and physical. But if you have bioimpedance, you may want to do it along with ultrasound. I'm not sure that biomarkers really have a role, so I wouldn't agree with that. Um, but blood volume monitoring may be helpful if it's available to you, and using those things all together to help assess your patient. <clears throat> so in conclusion, so we know volume overload is an important contributor to adverse outcomes in our patients. Point of care ultrasound and bioimpedance um, can be helpful and also complementary for the assessment of dry weight um, in dialysis patients. Um, we still don't know whether or not this will help improve mortality, um, but we think uh, if you're comfortable using it, if you know how to use it, along with your physical assessment, I think it's, it's worth doing. And fortunately, there are many ways to learn about these things if they're um, not known to you. So the dietitian breakout study um, <clears throat> session is going to have some information about bioimpedance and, and how to use it. Um, and then there are lots and lots of ultrasound courses available, and I'll show you some of them. <clears throat> But I think we all know that we still need to think even if we're using technology. So we have to put information in clinical context as we always do. And so I think that's why when we've stepped away and used uh, sole technology like biofeedback, sometimes uh, things don't go as well as we'd hope. 
So in terms of ultrasound, which I can speak to more, and the dietitians can probably speak more to uh, how to learn bioimpedance, um, there's a lot of courses available. Um, there is a Canadian Society of Point of Care Ultrasound, which has a certification um, aspect to it. So I think some people worry about the medical legal aspect. So are you trained enough to really make an assessment to show uh, something, a finding that will actually be used in clinical decision making? So to help with that, there are these certification uh, methods, which basically just means doing enough that you're comfortable and, and, and uh, you know, know the, the pitfalls. Um, and then there's a BC um, point of care ultrasound uh, website. Um, there's some really great websites that have video tutorials like the Western Sono website. The National Kidney Foundation does every year and as part of their spring meetings, they have uh, a course. Um, and then there's some good textbooks as well, which I've listed here. Again, these are the group from London, Ontario. So that's all I had, but I'm happy to answer any questions, hopefully um, can to discuss you know, the practicalities or any technical questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Harris. I've had some questions sent in here. Um, if BC clinicians are interested in gathering point of care ultrasound skills, what resources are available? Yeah, so I'll go back to, to this slide. <clears throat> so actually with the point, BC Point of Care Ultrasound website, you can actually arrange a course wherever you are. So there's groups of physicians who are trained in point of care that will actually come to you and put on a course. Um, it's not without cost, I have to say, um, but um, certainly there's lots of courses available both locally in Vancouver, but the opportunity to have them come to wherever you live, I think, is, is a great one. And what are your thoughts on handheld versus scan versus a regular machine for lung ultrasound? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I do find that the handheld machines, and, and many of you may be familiar with the GEVQ, the V scanner, um, it's very hard to see. Um, so I prefer the larger full-size ultrasound machines to the smaller ones. That being said, the technology is improving all the time and the resolution is improving. So I suspect that the smaller machines will get better and better with respect to resolution. So at the moment at VGH, we have a big machine in the dialysis unit, which I find you can see the lung ultrasound really well and, and encourages people to use it more because they can actually see what they're doing. Um, but the handheld ones do, do work and are easy to carry around. How much is a bioimpedance machine? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask that. I looked it up in the list prices. They never tell you, right? Um, <laughs> so it's something in the order of several, several thousand dollars. But I can't give you an exact. And you do, most of the companies will make you buy the uh, software and whether or not it's compatible with your computer system. So sometimes there's some added costs, but maybe the dietitians in the next session may be able to speak to that, but they never tell you a price. <laughs> Unless anyone in the room knows. Sunit? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that, I guess that's another caveat of the physical exam in that, yes, yeah, swelling can be lots of different reasons, venous stasis, calcium channel blockers, as you say. And if we do it on everyone, A, we won't have time. And uh, B, we'll get ans you know, answers to questions we didn't have. 
Um, so, I, I mean, at least that's how I'm using it now, is for patients who have problems. Um, but if the studies, say, did show, you know, a couple years down the road that, you know, using it, say, for all new patients or using it for X and Y patients was actually changing their mortality, then maybe we would do that. But I think for now, given the lack of hard endpoints, problem-based care is, is the most suited, and that's a good point. Um, how do you decide on fluid challenge when you see the B lines? <laughs> that sounds like a question that's not related to dialysis if we're fluid challenging them. Um, so I guess that's a more of a question for uh, inpatient care, critical care. So um, I think, you know, critical care people would tell you that they use an algorithm based on um, the IVC, the blood pressure, and the lung ultrasound assessment to know when to back off on fluid assessment. Um, so when you see a lot of B lines, that may be an indicator to stop giving fluids, and some people have used that as part of an algorithm, and you can um, kind of uh, have to individualize it to your patient. But if you examine somebody who comes in to emerge, say they're a dialysis patient or they're not, um, and they're septic and, and you know, hypotensive and, and they have no B lines and you give them fluids and now they have B lines and they're on oxygen. As part of that clinical picture, I think most people would back off at that point. And some have advocated that as a good marker to know that you've done enough with fluids and maybe they need pressors or critical care. And so that's how I see a lot of critical care people use it. Uh, when will the results of the LUST trial be available? It's a great question, and I tried to look that up a couple nights ago. Um, they say that the, on clinicalstudies.gov that it was closing last year. So I think that means soon. <laughs> but I don't know when. And as somebody has asked, um, isn't the bioimpedance machine available uh, from Fresenius with our hemodialysis machine contracts. Oh, maybe, maybe it is. I, I don't know. Probably some administrators in the room may be able to tell me. I know we have one at VGH. They have one at St. Paul's. I think a number of units have them, uh, but I don't know how. What were you going to say? I think that's all the questions. Oh, oh, oh there oh. is one more. Oh, and do you recommend that all hemodialysis units should have a bioimpedance machine? I think if you feel that you're going to use it and invest in it. So I think we saw from the answers that in some cases it was available but not used. So I would suggest not buying it unless you have a plan for training and sustainability. Um, so I know that's been a problem in some units where they have one nurse that knows how to do it, but nobody else. And then in that case, it's not going to be feasible. So I think you need to come up with a business plan of actually how you're going to roll it out. But I think if you have people that are motivated that want to use it and are trained to use it, then I would suggest that it's useful. And how do you differentiate between chronic heart failure and overload with this machine? With which machine? Biom. Oh, I mean, whoever asked that question, do they mean the bioimpedance machine or the ultrasound? I mean, one? I could probably ultra, ultrasound. Sound. I, I don't think you, you can, no. It's just, you know, whether it's chronic or acute, you're going to see B lines, you're going to see overhydration. Um, you know, if you're more advanced with ultrasound and you want to look at the, you know, the left ventricular function and other things, you may be able to differentiate, but. We see it in both acute and chronic. Are you able to put a leader volume um, on that sort of overload when you're measuring those vertical lines? Is it certain number of lines means this amount of? Oh, a leader amount. It, I think the question like, is, is there a leader amount for the number of B lines? No, I think it's, it's relative, but I think those um, scoring systems that look at severity have correlated with both bad outcomes and pulmonary pressures, but no, I couldn't tell you a liter, liter amount. That might be why in some patients you may want to ultrasound them at the beginning of the run and the end of the run to know if you're getting there, but you're still left with that difficulty of how they got there. So they had a high interdialytic weight gain. So if you got them dry at the end, but every time they're coming wet at the beginning, then you need to look at dialysis frequency, scheduling, and dietary advice. So. 
Um, we're all happy if we get them good at the end, but we need to prevent them from getting that as we know it's, it's not safe for our patients. I think that's it. Another question? Oh, another question. <clears throat> So the question is, um, if someone's volume overloaded, will they manifest themselves with the left side of heart failure or the right side of heart failure? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the ultrasound of the lung, you're assessing the left side. Yeah. And IVC diameter, you're assess assessing probably the right side. Yeah. Which side of heart failure comes first? Oh, I think it depends on the patient. I don't think there's a particular answer for that. The interesting thing about lung ultrasound and what we're learning in particular, as I mentioned, it's not just based on them being volume overloaded, it's based on their left ventricular function, as you mentioned. But there's this third factor, which we have to consider a why about, is the lung permeability. So why are, there's some factors in terms of the pressures in the lungs that are making them put more fluid in the lungs than even we would anticipate with their volume overload or their left ventricular function. And so that's a bit of a mystery, but may be related to things like inflammation and pneumonia and things like that. But I think there's no answer to say every patient has different physiology. Um, but we do know that we see patients with no swelling, with B lines, and we see not as much patients who have swelling but no B lines. So I would say it's a pretty sensitive find, and early finding. Yeah. So I have read literature, they actually mentioned the first sign of heart failure is right side overload, or first sign of volume overload. They do assess the uh, right ventricle first. But right, I, I but that's probably echo, that's probably echo and pulmonary pressures, and, and we know that swelling is not an early finding. So from a clinical standpoint in the practicalities of dialysis, I think you probably would see findings on lung ultrasound quite early. All right, thanks everyone.